right, yeah. right. I knew this whole thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. shit's crazy. Universe. Universe, bro. Yeah, meant to be. <laughs> it's meant to be. All right, so here we are. Episode three. Episode three. Woo! We made it. Fucking crushing it. Yeah. Not canceled yet. Well, don't say that. We're just filming right now. Well, I, you know, I mean, like, you know, you get a run of shows. Are they going to renew for a second season? It's like, yeah, you got enough of the, people mm. like the show. Mm. So I'm assuming that people are liking the show, which is why we've been invited back to, to do another one. Do the intro. Ah. <laughs> Welcome back to the third episode of the Grow Strong Podcast. My name is Rory, and I'm here with my deputy, Nicholas Schweitzer. I'll be your deputy any day. <laughs> I actually looked up <laughs> assistant synonyms uh, <laughs> since the last episode where's and my, de- decided where, to go with deputy. Where's my star? I'll get you a star. Okay, good. I'll get you a star. Yeah, there were a couple good ones in there. I'm Deputy Schweitzer. Deputy, my deputy, Nicholas Good Schweitzer. Good to see you. Yeah. And today we are going to be talking about Lotus. <laughs> yeah. First thing I want to start with is, you know, we get time after time after time, uh, you know, when people see the retail price of our Grow, Bloom and Boost, which is kind of the base of, you know, our simplified nutrient program. They tend to put that up against other grow blooms and boosts out there that are much more simplistic in terms of the recipe that those people use. And the thing that we hear over and over and over is why are your nutrients so expensive? But they're not seeing the whole picture. And again, this is always something that's very hard in marketing to kind of get across the message. And so I figured that this, you know, kind of conversational format was a good way to kind of get this out there and why it is that actually our nutrients are still a way better deal than 90% of the nutrient companies out there. Yeah, I mean, I think actually it comes out to be less expensive than what you'd find with most recipes. That's what I'm saying. We're a good deal compared to 90% of the ones out there. Best value, best value. Well, why don't you start to elaborate on why that's the case? I was gonna gonna lob it to you, Sheriff. Okay, well. No, I got you. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we'll both take it at the same time or yeah. we can finish Let, each other's I mean, sandwiches let, I mean let's let that's a good idea finish yeah. each other's senses that should be not very annoying for the uh, crowd crowd <laughs> anyway Way. let's start with my personal story because this is kind of where the idea for simplifying the recipe for Lotus came from which was You know, back in the day, uh, I used to grow with some very good companies' products. Um, You know, Fox Farm being one of them. I've always liked Fox Farm's products. I think they do a great job. I used to use their Grow Big, their Big Bloom, their Tiger Bloom. Um, And I used to have to supplement with a lot of other nutrient, uh, you know, uh, uh, micronutrient blends and a bunch of other stuff, seaweed extracts and everything to get a complete nutrient recipe into my final product, right? Because, you know, just as we were talking with light spectrum in the last episode, you know, there's the macronutrients, but then there's a lot of secondary and micronutrients. And each one of those has a very important role in growing nice, healthy plants, right? So you need that whole micro secondary and macronutrient package. And so in order to achieve that, I was having to use probably upwards of 12 bottles in later flowering to achieve what I can get out of a simplistic recipe, simplistic meaning that it's all in one, all in one place. Um, But Lotus has everything that I was using in that 12 part recipe in three bottles. And so really that's kind of where the disconnect happens is when somebody goes into a hydro store and they're buying a recipe that was similar to what I used to use, which I know a lot of people that are in similar shoes, they're going and they're taking a grow off of the shelf that literally only has a few components. It's got an NPK value to it and it might have a little bit of calcium in it. It might have a little bit of something else, but it's a very simplistic recipe that you're going to have to add in a lot of the secondary nutrients and a lot of the micronutrients in the back end, right? So you're going to need one, maybe two more bottles just to supplement that one veg to get it to where you want it to be, right? 
And so with Lotus, that's the problem that we were trying to solve. We were trying to not only take out the inefficiencies of liquid nutrients, which is you're basically hauling around jugs of water, right? And so it's expensive to ship, it's exp you know, heavy to carry out of the store, can be extremely messy. So that's why we chose to go with the powdered format on our nutrients. But then we also wanted to take all of those you know, 10, 12 parts and try to jam them into as few bottles as we possibly could. Right. And so that's what we essentially did with Lotus Nutrients. And so that's when you're putting value on what you get from Lotus Nutrients versus that 12 part recipe. You really have to take that in mind. You have to look at everything that you're spending money on, on that 12 part, 10 part, whatever it might be recipe versus what you get out of the three bottles of Grow Bloom Boost, maybe adding a little bit of our cow mag if you're growing cocoa or some other medium that requires it. But basically it's those three components that you're that that's all you have to buy there's it's not, really there's nothing else need. behind it you don't need to supplement that at all yeah and it's going to rival uh if not beat the results that you were getting from your optimized 12-part formula the, when you were really the quality in. that i've seen off of lotus time and time again easily rivals the or or, or in most instances beats that 12-part recipe well uh, you know what i'll tell you if it didn't it wouldn't be on the market because as you develop products for our company that you know, level of, uh, um, what's the Care? word I'm looking at? Yeah. That, well, that, that standard, yeah, uh, yeah, that yeah. standard you put on everything that we put out, uh, regard if it takes longer for us to get something to market, if it's not perfect, you're not going to launch it. Yep. And I actually, I really respect that and appreciate that as far as our product development is concerned. Your and deputy's your got your back. What's that? I said your deputy's deputy got, your back. got the back. <laughs> Yeehaw! <laughs> Shouldn't take the hat off. That was my <laughs> pattern. So, um, do you know what the combined cost was of those twelve parts that you were using at the time? Uh, like Gosh, per receiving? gallon, I do not know what that was, but I know every time I walked in a hydro store, I was spending five hundred bucks minimum to yeah. get out of there, right? And the the other problem with it was when you start to use all of these different parts. You know, each one of them has their own measurement or their own quantity that they're being added to that water at, right? And so it's really easy to take a recipe like that, which the recipe I was using was handed down from some friends that lived on the Central Coast who we referred to as the Ring of Fire because their flower that they grew was some of the most amazing flower I've ever seen in my entire life. You know, I mean, it was that, again, that bag that you see across the table and it was like, whoa, what's that? You know, and it was, uh, you know, it was a Romulan strain and it was just like, it was amazing. I mean, it was the, some of the best flower I've ever seen in my entire life to this day. Um, and so it was, a, it was a recipe that was handed down, you know, uh, probably a, a for, by a few different growers. Um, and if you were to take any one of those components and put either too much or too little in, you now have an imbalance in that recipe. And so as you start to scale up and as you start to push into the higher EC levels, any one of those little imbalances on the low end or the high end is gonna start to get out of control as you start to push that EC I, up. And if you're making an issue, a mistake like that, you most likely don't know where it is. And now you've got all these yeah, you've variables got 10 or 12 that you've gotta troubleshoot. Right. How much time did it take you to uh, administer this recipe yeah uh, i mean it was it was every time i would walk up to do a reservoir uh refill and mix all these things it was always like ugh, <laughs> you know i mean i had it you know this before that this yeah, is in milliliters this is in grams and, <laughs> yeah yeah i mean everything was was mostly in milliliters so it was easy that way because it was all liquid right yeah, yeah well i guess some of it actually was powder um but yeah, I mean, it's like you're using the big jug to measure some of it. You're using the pint glass to measure some. You're using, you know, the shot glass to measure some because it all is different potency. Um, you know, you're, you're, you're splashing, you know, nutrients everywhere. The bottles would always have water, you know, the, the, the nutrients running down them, which would then calcify. Like, it's just, it's a mess. Yeah. It's a mess. All of those bottles would always end up a mess. And because I'm always having to do 10 parts, I would always be mixing different, you know, sometimes I'd do 50 gallons, sometimes I'd do 80, sometimes I'd do 30, right? Depending on what I was doing. And I'd always have to do the math of like, you know, all these different parts, right? Not just one or two bottles that I'd have to do the math on, but all of these bottles. And so it was, it was a complete pain in the ass. And to be quite honest with you, 
I even had up on my wall the, the recipe yeah. that I would use, right? This and this and this. And every time I'd leave my grow to one of my friends when I'd go on vacation, it was like, hey, check out the master list of the recipe on the wall and try not to screw it up. And you, you get know? phone calls. Uh, can you translate all this for me? Yeah, right. And yeah. so, you know, so it was, it was overly complicated, yeah. right? It's not an impossible thing, but it was overly complicated. And that's one thing that we always wanted to solve. It just wasn't, it was, wasn't fun. It was a pain in the ass. Yeah, Every right. time. Right. And yeah. it's one of the pain points that we wanted to solve with Lotus Nutrients. So when we have people who go in the store and see that our grow is, let's say, 30% more than the competitors grow, what they're really missing in that equation, they're putting, it's not an apples to apples comparison, yeah. right? What they're seeing in our veg bottle or our grow bottle is a complete veg recipe that you could use just completely by itself, all standalone, yep. which is what it's meant for, right? Um, same thing when you get to flour, we do have a flour and we do have a, a, a boost. And those two components hold every single macro, micro, and secondary nutrient that you need to have perfectly healthy growth, super awesome, badass flowers every single time. And so when you're looking at the price comparison of that bottle against another bottle of Bloom that really only contains an NPK and maybe one or two other things, you're going to have to supplement behind that. So take all three or four of those bottles, put that cost together, now look back at our Bloom and tell me that it's still expensive because it's a damn good deal yeah. when you look at it in that light. I mean, it, it is a difficult thing to market too, right? Because picture somebody uh, comparing two starter kits on the web and you see ours and it comes with three bottles and then you see a competitor's and it comes with 12 bottles and they're the same price, you know? And you're like, oh, I get 12 bottles with that one. So I only get three with that. And so you, you kind of, you know, it's, it's counterintuitive in that way. It's like more bottles, that's better, but no, it's not. If you can have everything that you need in just those three, it's, it's actually a much greater value and it's going to create a much greater growing experience. It's almost comical how easy it is. I have that star at home and granted, you know, the, the scale of it is far smaller than anything that you were describing, um, but it scales in the same way. You know, it's all I do is I have a gallon jug uh, pitcher. I uh, look at the recipe card. I need a half a tablespoon of that. The, the, the measuring spoon is included in the container, scoop that, scoop that, mix it up and I'm pouring and I'm done. Yeah. And that, it's really, that's all there is to it. Yeah. And I mean, you know, again, I, 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 our, our mission on this podcast is to unite, not divide. But I, you know, I do have to say, and every grower that's out there knows this by this point, but it's like the nutrient companies have done an amazing job at feeding the false narrative Add to you that bottle. you need yeah. more stuff. Mm -hmm. You need this, you need that. Oh, now you need this, now you need this, right? Because I know there's people out there that have more than 12 parts in their <laughs> recipe. I mean, I know of some nutrient companies that if you look at their product offering, they've literally got 40 or 50 different things. Yeah. And it all is like, oh, this is critical for this, that's critical for this, that's critical for this, right? And it's like they've done an, a genius job at getting you to buy more and more and more bottles and spend more and more money on their product because they say you need it. I can tell you from experience of 20 plus, 25 plus years of growing that there have only been two things in that journey that I started using and was like, holy shit, that made a huge difference. Like that, I can see and tangibly feel the difference on that. Every other product that I've ever added, I'm like, Eh, like there might there might have been some you know some effect. Yeah, it might be a little more crystally, yeah. you know. And so it's like there's a lot of it is kind of snake oil to a certain degree, um, and a lot of it is probably them honestly peeling parts of the recipe out of something that they used to manufacture yeah. and adding it into a yeah. new bottle that says, oh, you need this now, right? Yeah. Because it's now missing from the recipe on this other bottle. I mean, I guess in their defense, you know, it is worth saying that it is kind of difficult to get these macro and micro elements to play nicely together, especially in liquid, right? It's not yep. going to be stabilized. The shelf life is going to suffer. Uh, and so there are sometimes it, you have to separate those things. Um, and then sometimes it's just like, hey, what other additive and uh, other skew can we add into the portfolio to, um, you know, to squeeze out some some more. Yeah. And it was I mean, it was honestly it was one of the biggest challenges at first with Lotus was to get 
all of that stuff in a bottle and working and not yeah stabilized and not you know reacting with each other you know i mean some of our you know again we're all about honesty on this podcast some of our first formulations the bloom turned into a rock (laughs) it just did you know it was like it was either the calcium that was in there that was you know uh really hydrolytic and pulling in too much moisture when you open the bottle or whatever it is and so we had to go through a couple formulations before we got it right yeah um you know and now even you know even now we get people that are like hey your nutrients are are, are kind of you know they look uh, what what moist. people describe as like moist right yeah. and it's like no it's but like that's the way it is it looks like kinetic sand is yeah. what is how we describe tons it tons of fun kinetic sand yeah yeah oh, but it's, don't it's play bl- with your nutrients it, it's it's a blast yeah. it's a blast sand castles and oh yeah weird shapes it's and the weird. way it drips it's out of your hand yeah. and stuff yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like magic uh, <laughs> much like lotus yes yeah. right yeah. and so and so that formulation is a very complex formulation which leads to that consistency right. But like, guess what? We don't care what, like, you know, like drop your preconceived notions of what a powder nutrient should look like because it's not there for looks. I don't care what it looks like. I care what it does to my plants. Yeah. And if, if you know, I, I kid you not when I say that out of all of the people that have ever tried Lotus Nutrients, the performance of that product has never come up as being something that people are dissatisfied with. Everybody is always blown away with the performance of that product in growing plants, right? All of the complaints we've ever heard about Lotus Nutrients is from the consistency side of things. Yeah. And it's like, who cares about the consistency? Drop your preconceived notions. How did it grow your plants? Oh, it was amazing? That's what we're looking for. Yeah, exactly. You're not trying to build a sandcastle with it. You're trying to get the best out of your grow. And if it performs as advertised, then yeah, the consistency doesn't matter. But it is all just because of that preconceived notion that people have. Like, there's something wrong with this. It's supposed to be completely... Yeah, it's like supposed to be talcum powder or something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's not. It's normal. And uh, (laughs) it's going to kick ass for your growth. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so I I, I just want to, you know, make sure that, you know, everybody knows what they're looking at and is able to compare apples to apples. And that goes for all the products in the industry, right? Sometimes you're not looking at apples to apples. The same goes for grow tents, same goes for grow lights. Like know what you're looking at before you make a judgment call on the price that you're paying versus somebody else's product because they might not even be in the same league. And we find that a lot, right? I mean, we have premium products. They are more expensive than a lot of our competitors, but you're getting what you pay for. Yeah. You're getting quality products that have, you know, balance to them like Lotus Nutrients. Uh, and you're actually ending up paying less for that product than you would for a complete recipe from somebody else because that we don't have 10 part stars. You know, that's another interesting thing about it too, though, that that's deceptive because that tiny bottle right there will last you a long time. Right. But you're comparing it to a big ass jug and you're like, oh, this tiny bottle or that big ass jug. But if you break down what you have to feed every time uh, you either change your reservoir or water, you need a fraction of that than what you're going to need from that big bottle. Yeah, they're highly concentrated. Yeah. So it it, it lasts longer than the typical comparable um, bottle sold by uh, other brands. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so do you uh, want to talk a little bit about the difference between, you know, like synthetic, um, elements versus, you know, the naturally derived? Yeah, elements? sure. Yeah. I mean, this guy, this almost kind of came up on, uh, you know, the podcast that I did with Mr. Grow it, hmm. um, because he had asked, you know, uh, about organic versus synthetic, you know? And I mean, synthetic is um, a a kind of a a bad term that's been put on any fertilizer that is created with fertilizer salts, right? And so a fertilizer salt can come in many forms. Fertilizer salt can literally be a derivative of something that comes straight out of the earth, right? It's just a simple, simple molecule that's pulled out of something that is naturally occurring. And it can be all the way down to something that's pulled out of, say, like a chemical process like petroleum mm-hmm. production, right? Yep. Uh, and so the two of those... Oftentimes is. Oftentimes it is. Yeah. And so the two of those are, are very different. And then there's also a fully synthesized molecule that is made in a lab, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so all of the ingredients that we use in Lotus Nutrients do come from the first, the derivative sources 
of naturally occurring products in nature, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, are there uh, industrial processes to extract those and to drive those? Absolutely, right? But that happens with a lot of things. It's not made in a lab and it surely isn't made by chemical process or industrial process like you know, petroleum production or any kind of byproduct from something like that. Right. You know, and so is Lotus Nutrients organic? No, it's not. Um, do I prefer growing cannabis at least with non-organic products? I do, you know, I do. And the reason for that is, is because they are hyper available for that plant to use. Yeah. And, 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 you know, it's funny, I came away from that, that Mr. Grow it episode because he admitted to being one of the people that turns down his lights, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is 100% fine. Yep. But he also is on the side of organic growing, which good for him, right? Because organic is super important. Sure. And there's a lot of people that, that prefer to grow that way. Uh, and there's a lot of people that would only smoke organic flour, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, but I kind of, I, I stepped away from that and I kind of started to think about it, right? So anything that's considered organic is basically the, the, the nutrients become available as microbes in the soil break down organic compounds within that soil, mm -hmm. right? And so you can only have so many available nutrients at any given time in an organic grow because you are relying on the microbes to break down that matter and release the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium and everything else, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are ways to speed up that process in organic growing. There are ways to increase PPM and all that kind of stuff, but you're not going to get a level of available nutrients that you can get out of fertilizer salts. And so when you think about cranking up that light to 1000 PPFD, what have we been saying, right? That plant just wants to go. It wants to feed. It wants more and more and more. And so that's hard to keep up with or harder to keep up with. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's harder to keep up with in an organic setting than it would be by hyper available fertilizer salts. Yeah. Right. It's like it's always available. It's always right there. You can control the levels much more accurately with fertilizer salts than you can with organic. And it's and closer so to a full time job with uh organics if you're going to push it to that level. Yeah. And that's not saying that you can't, you absolutely yeah. can, yeah. you know? Um, and, and I don't, I don't, you know, I, I don't consider myself an expert on organics and mm -hmm. so I don't want to get too deeply into it. Sure. Uh, maybe we could get our boy from build a soil on oh, yeah, to yeah. talk about that. Cause that he's guy, a master yes, and he's, he sure is. he's super dialed. Yep. Um, and so that would be a great episode to have and he yeah. could probably school us on that. Right. But I think he would also probably agree with some of the points that we're making oh, with, yeah. if you want to drive your car, in redline it like you can with these really high powered LEDs, you have to have that hyper available nutrient, uh, you know, nutrient regimen for that plant, which is why I like to use fertilizer salts because I'm always looking for as much biomass as I can possibly get of the highest quality that I can possibly get in terms of bag appeal and everything else. And yeah. so, you know, really to achieve that, I've always found that fertilizer salts are the way to go. And, you know, that's largely why in commercial facilities you see the same thing, right? Those guys are going for high biomass, high, you know, bag appeal. And so that's why most of them are using fertilizer salts. Sure. And so, I mean, the takeaway is that you can't lump all salts or synthetics into the same category. You have true synthetics made in a lab. You have dirty salts that are derived from, as like byproduct. And then you have clean salts that are derived uh, from natural sources. Correct. And Lotus is all cleanly sourced, naturally derived uh, elements. Correct. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Dig it. Yeah. So let's move on to, uh, you know, we said that we were going to talk uh, about all of the uh, grow off contestants. <laughs> Uh, and we kind of want to throw this little bit in just uh, to break, <laughs> break, break, break the humor. Um, yeah, so we were, we were talking about last episode, we were talking about, um, you know, how much we love the grow off and the contestants that are participating. And we've also highlighted a few times, um, you know, how important the customer service and the grow support uh, side of things is for us. And I, I, I you know, I just, uh, something came up recently and, you know, sometimes even, uh, the best intentions, things go horribly wrong. Um, there was a grow off contestant uh, who was having a little bit of trouble dialing in his grow. And um, this one went to Nick, you know, uh, sometimes they do. Um, 
escalate all the way up to him uh, just because if it's a complicated question uh, and one of our uh, staff members doesn't feel confident um, in responding to it, they'll pass it along to him to make sure that they're on the right track because we never want to give anybody misinformation. So, And to be clear, <laughs> this Grow contestant, who we'll keep anonymous, uh, first of all, you know who you are. I want to apologize to you. The way this came off was not how I intended it to come off. And it wasn't that he was having trouble. It's that he was seeing different results with our spectrum versus the spectrums that he was used to, which was white light spectrums, sure. right? And that goes into this whole conversation that we were saying that those two spectrums are a lot different and you have to drive ours a lot harder, yeah. right? And so that ended up, I think, being the end result of what fixed the you know, slight inconsistencies that he was seeing between sure. the two lights, right? Yeah. But yeah, of course, this came to me. Yeah, so let me, like, good, good grow support starts with us asking a lot of questions, right? Because there's a lot of variables and you really got to figure out where they're at with each one of those. You know, how far is your light? What is your nutrient uh, regimen? You know, what is the the, uh, the watering schedule? Different things like that. By asking those questions, you can you can start to pinpoint where there might the issue might be coming from. And so, uh, <laughs> so Nick was doing just this with this grower, trying to find out uh, about the grow, asking a number of questions. And uh, one in particular, um, he asked, and the, the Groff contestant uh, kind of took exception to it and got defensive. And, uh, you know, Nick sends it to me and he goes, hey, I, do, do you see something wrong with this? I, I, I'm just trying to help uh, this guy out with his grow. And he got really upset with me and kind of sent me back a nasty email. And I was like, well, let me take a look at it. So I read the email. I was like, oh, dude, I see what you did here. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? The double question mark. Let me ask why, you this. Why, what, can't, why can't I put the double? I mean, I, I, still, right. I still don't really quite get When those. you're writing an email or a text or anything written, right? Hmm. There's a big difference between this. Have you ever grown with LED? And the double question mark. Have you ever grown with LED? That's how that reads. And so well, but see, whoa, whoa, <laughs> the whoa, use whoa, of the whoa, double whoa, question whoa. mark. Wait a minute. Why? So if I was going to say, have you ever grown with LED? <laughs> yeah. Right. And I think there's like a high powered portion in there. Yeah. Wouldn't that be a question mark exclamation point? That's the only thing worse than the double question mark. So that's worse than a double question. Oh, that's like, have you ever grown with LED? Right? Like, are you guys offended when you see a double that's question almost, mark? Oh, Can this you guys is, put it down in the comment section and let us know how that rolls? This is universal. Here's <laughs> the thing. Here's the thing. Since then, because this has been a long standing discussion between Rory and I and the double question mark and fucking whatever. So I've been noticing that in text message, in email, I just double hit the question mark every Frickin' time. And Every time. Everybody thinks I have, you you're know, always exasperated. You know how many second question marks I've erased since <laughs> this has happened? Well, good. On almost every single email. Yeah. And I don't mean anything by it. It's just like, it's an extra question mark, you know? It's like, hey, like I'm, I'm super curious about this question is for, how I I've been working with this guy it. for 10 years and I, 12, I've always felt like if he kidding. asked me a question, he could not believe that it wasn't done yet or that I didn't do it. And I'm like, well, I, I'm just hearing about this for the first time. Yeah, Double what was this? A, a week. He didn't mean it a, like week, that a at week all. later he was just in G chat, I asked you if something had been done yet, and I double question marked him, and he thought I was yelling at him. Yeah, yeah. All right, I want to hear all. I want to hear everybody's comments on this. Is a double question mark really as bad as? I'm telling you, the only thing, the only thing I'm a nice more guy, affronting is you know? the question mark exclamation point, and then after that is the question mark exclamation point, and then another question mark. Ah, uh, the same. Now you just can't even believe it. Not the same. All mm. right. Well, anyway, this whole thing was just to say <laughs> to this grow contestant, <laughs> I'm sorry. I did like I wasn't trying to push any of my, you know, or question your ego skill or, or question your like skill that. or anything. Yeah. I was just trying to get to the bottom of what was going on. It was, was just a question. On. It was just a question so, with one extra question mark. Yeah. 
Sorry, yeah, I mean, but that, that is kind of funny how things can be, you know, lost in translation. Well, that's why in the, in the that's word. why we shouldn't communicate through email and text messages, yeah. right? Yeah, inflection and tone. Yeah, and, and you know, communication is more like the pitch of your voice, yeah. uh, and the cadence yeah. than the actual words that you use. So remember that when you're leaving comments on videos like this, right? Yeah. Be kind to each other. Don't double question mark each other. And don't troll each other. Don't yeah. troll us. You can troll our competitors. No, don't do that either. It's not. Yeah. All right. What are we talking about Love. next? Um, uh, colons. <laughs> colons and semicolons. I don't know when to use a semicolon. Parenthesis? <laughs> All right. Let's talk about carbon filters real quick, since we've got one sitting back in this lovely corner being so inconspicuous. Ooh, look at that thing just sitting there. What's it doing there? It is pretty... Is it filtering Cute. anything? Beautiful looking filter. Yeah. So uh, why uh, why is ours unique? What's so great about ours, Rory? Sheriff? Uh, well, I would say the uh, thing that strikes me the most is our source of carbon. Oh, I thought you were going to say my really impeccable design on the outside. I, I didn't want to give the obvious answer. Um, I mean, I definitely love the sex appeal of that it's filter. Sweet, it's, right? It is the sexiest carbon filter on the market for sure. Uh, and it is worthy of, of bearing the Gorilla brand. Um, I can still see your guys' faces when I first showed it to you. Yeah. It's like shock and awe. It took me a while to pick my jaw <laughs> back up off the ground. I was like, it's cold. You've done it again. You've done it. What is this <laughs> beauty you have doth laid before me? Yeah. Yeah, because most carbon filters are silver. Yeah. And ours yeah. is gold. Yeah, people have copied us since then. Yeah. Mm. But anyway, you were saying? The, the, the carbon, source yeah. of carbon, mm. which mm -hmm. I think is very important because most sources of carbon are? Mined. Mined. A lot. Right. Uh, you know, most Australian carbon, which is like always kind of been this gold standard or so, supposed gold standard of carbon. But yeah, I mean, that's literally like pit mined in, in Australia, you know? Um, and to be quite honest with you, it's a way less efficient carbon than what we use, which is coconut carbon. Yeah. And so coconut carbon comes from the, um, you know, the fired uh, husks mm -hmm. of coconuts, which is a huge industry. Um, not only do you have, you know, coconut milk that comes out of those and coconut meat, but then you also see, uh, you know, cocoa coming in as, you know, probably the preferred medium of a lot of people. Um, and then you've got a byproduct of it. Um, that is fired and turned into coconut carbon. Yeah. Uh, and that coconut carbon is superior for a number of reasons. Uh, would you like to go into them? <laughs> <laughs> the, I, well, I mean, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah, I mean, it's, I, I just think it's really important that, that it's sustainable. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like the this is a renewable resource that's actually is just cleaner and it's more effective. Yeah than its predecessor. Yeah, so it, the sustainability factor of it is is massive, um, you know, because obviously everything we do moving forward on this planet needs to be sustainable or we're screwed, Yeah. right? Uh, and so you that's- You can't pit mine forever. And so that's really important. Um, but getting onto the technical aspect of why it is more efficient, right? So it has, um, coconut carbon has much more surface area than a traditional carbon like the Australian uh, carbon that you see in a lot of competitors' products. Yep. And what that has to do with is the microporosity of the actual carbon molecule. Microporosity. <laughs> of the actual uh, carbon granule itself, right? So it has much more pathways within the carbon um, and much more uh, porous uh, body of it, which gives more surface area. Because really, how carbon works is it actually uses adsorption. Adsorption. I was just going to say adsorption. Not, not ab, ab. Not absorption. Ad. Which yeah. is basically um, the collection of the molecule on a surface area, right? And so once a molecule collects on a surface area, that is now soiled it's, and need, you know, it's we, bound. So, yeah. so the more surface area that you have for VOCs or whatever organic molecules to adsorb onto, the better and more effective it's that carbon is going to be. Yeah. 
So uh, can the carbon that is in the filter, can that be renewed by the consumer? No, uh, no, it, it can't. Um, you know, there used to be, um, gosh, back in the late 90s, um, you know, when I was kind of first getting growing, there used to be carbon filters that you could open up and you could dump out the carbon and you yeah. could buy a bag of carbon, you could put it in. Messy business. It's super messy yeah. business. It's super messy business. Um, you know, all of our carbon filters have a, a machine that will shake them vigorously to get any of the air pockets out, settle all those carbon uh, granules in. Can't really do that at home. So there was a lot of a, like a lot of disadvantages to renewing your carbon filter with new carbon. Right. Um, it and, doesn't and, seem sustainable. Yeah, and, and I mean, honestly, when you look at how much metal is on that carbon filter, there's not a lot. Yeah. You know, there's not a lot. That is mainly carbon. Um, you know, our carbon bed is over an inch thick. Um, and so it's really not that much metal on there. And those things will last quite a long time. Yeah, so pound, per, pound for pound, you know, a comparable sized uh, carbon filter, any brand USA, that's, that's running on, you know, these pit mine sources. How much longer uh, are you going to get effectiveness out of the cocoa carbon versus these because of the extra surface area and it's the more... Um, yeah, so, I mean, the longevity of a filter matters there's a lot of things that go into how long that filter is going to last, yeah. right? How much air is being moved through it, how much VOCs and organic compounds are contained within that air, right? So there's a lot of variables that one in one grow room, a, a, a four inch filter, like the one that's behind us could last for nine months and another where it could last for 15 months, mm -hmm. right? Um, so it's just volume of air and how many organic compounds are in that air. Yeah. But if you had a traditional filter that was running Australian carbon, you might get on a good estimate 12 months out of that filter. If you got 12 months out of that filter, you can pretty much guarantee that you're probably going to get somewhere around 15 months nice. out of a GGT filter yeah. because of that extra surface area that's within that carbon granule. Right on. Very good. Yeah, it's a great product, uh, you know, and it's another one of these that, I, you know, unfortunately seems to get a little bit overshadowed by uh, some of our more um, dominant product lines, but it's, you know, it's, it's one of my favorites and uh, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that we have it out there available for people. Yeah, and it's, I, mean, I mean, it's, you know, carbon filters are the number one way to pull stink out of the air. I mean, you can try ozone, you can try some of these other things, but at the end of the day, there's nothing that's going to be as effective as a carbon as filter carbon. at getting that job done. Um, you know, and in some places people don't care, right? It's like here in California, we, uh, you know, we're lucky enough to where it's accepted. And I don't know if I care that my neighbor can smell my garden, <laughs> you know? Uh, in fact, they probably have a garden themselves. But you know, largely in a lot of states, you still need to, you know, kind of, this is probably not something we want to have in this podcast. Uh, <laughs> I walk out of my front yard, I was like, there's a skunk in the neighborhood, yeah, right? You guys yeah, smell yeah, that? Yeah. It's like, can't, I think it's coming from not my house. So for people who are in other states where it's still legal, but maybe aren't as accepted by their neighbors with what they do, carbon filters are very important. And carbon filters are well, also good for controlling, you know, any kind of, you know, pathogens pa and things pathogens like that, right? Cleaning the air, kind of scrubbing stuff. the air, yeah. you know, even regardless of smell is like, you need to get that stuff out of there. And so it, 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 it doesn't just bind like odors. It combined, uh, uh, I'm sorry, binds, uh, pathogens and, and, uh, and things that could be harmful to your plants. Yeah. And a lot of people think of carbon filters as only being for exhaust air, but they can also be for intake air, mm. right? So that you're not bringing any of those bad, you know, things into your grow that can create problems like powdery mildews and all the, you know, other, other, other trials that we go through yep. as growers. So dig it. Yep. Did we really go another 30 minutes already? We're at 45. 45 minutes. That's a good, uh, it's a good show. Wow. What did we talk about? <laughs> like Frank the Tank. Hopefully, did we win? Hopefully, that's, did we get to keep the frat house? Hopefully, that's what you do every episode. <laughs> awesome. Oh, my favorite part of these episodes are hit the subscribe button. I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't. It's like it's an embarrassment of likes already. You know, it's like our <laughs> egos can only get so big. Maybe we should actually. I don't know do if anybody's again. liked anything yet. Okay. No, there's so like maybe they're showing me different. 
They're showing me different results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're trying to pump up your ego. Anyway, yeah. hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, share it all you want all across the world, and uh, we'll see you next Are time. Are we not at 7 billion views? Is that not the case? Is that what they told you? That's what they're showing me, yeah. <laughs> Millions of likes. All right.